We start in this particular study, part two of our message, with verse six. We need to do that. We have to do that. It's like the glue that holds it all together. It's the adhesive. And here it is. You, you read it a moment ago. But without faith, it is impossible to please him that is God. For he that is us who comes to God must believe that he is. We'll unpack that in a moment. And that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. I want you to let that uh, marinate in your heart for a moment. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. The God of the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, is a God who, listen, who moves in the realms of faith. That is both true of himself, and it must be true of you. This challenge separates those who are embracing recreational faith, or recreational Christianity, we'll call it, from those to where we would say the rubber meets the road. We're living at a time in our age where faith is being tested, and it must be tested. Why are you a lover of God, but you're going through difficult times? This has to be. I want to encourage you. I'm not joking. If you're a true follower of Jesus Christ, things could get tougher. So oh, I don't want to hear that. Nobody wants to hear that. I agree with you. But your faith must be, watch this, your faith must be one that is not only convincing to others around you, but most importantly, convincing to you. Look, God knows everything. You, you and I need to know if our faith is real. And the only way to know that is if you and I go through these things called fiery trials. Faith is something that we've learned last time. We'll keep learning through this chapter. It is a verb. It's action. You cannot say you have faith without having that backed up. Faith is on the move. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. That means doubt displeases him. Look, fear displeases God. Fear. I still see it today. So do you. Some people, I think, uh, think that fear is a virtue. It's not a virtue. Fear is a prison. Fear is something that will take you out at the knees. Fear will rob you of joy. Fear will rob you of God's plan for your life. Listen, without faith, notice, it's impossible to please him. That's not a hard statement because what he's announcing is that the faith that you and I have is in God. That's what pleases him. Do you remember when your kids were little? I think we've all done this. When they're real little, you could have said anything to them and they would have done it. You could have, you could have put them on the block wall and say, jump to me, and they jump. They're, and don't they just glide? When they're two years old, don't they just fall into your arms like this? You better... Not. You better be ready. They're so precious. No wonder why Jesus says for us to enter the kingdom of heaven, we must become like a little child. Why? Because little children are so believing. And by the way, parents, you need to protect that at all costs. You, listen, we need to be able to lay down our lives to protect their innocence. And the fact that they are built by God to believe. And when a little child jumps, they have that faith that the Bible talks about that we're to have for God. God might put you on top of this or on top of that or this issue or the other. And he might say to you, jump. You know, as we grow up, you never, you've never seen a teenager on the block wall and dad says, jump to me, son. The teenager will say, forget that noise. I'll come down myself. You've seen that happen in life. As believers, we need to grow stronger in our faith, but at the same time, we're going to become more childlike in our relationship to God. But all that we're talking about is all glued together in verse 6, and I want you to remember that. Very, very important. And so, um, I don't mean to upset anybody when I say this, but I need to make sure that we uh, say it right, and that is, without faith, it is impossible to please Him, meaning that God is the epicenter, He is the target, he is the terminus of the faith. Do you understand that, everybody? We're going we're gonna to learn this. You read it a moment ago that we who come to him must come to him believing that he is. We'll unpack that in a moment. God is saying, come to me. 
Jesus says if you're worried, if you're stressed, if this world is laboring you and the load that you're carrying is heavy, he says, come to me. 1 Peter 5, 7 says, cast all your care upon the Lord because he cares for you. Listen, don't say anything out loud because I, I just don't. Because if three of you say something, it's going to sound really bad in this room, this large. But the question is, do you really believe God? If we really believe God, then when he says, cast all your care upon me, I'll carry it. All of a sudden, we're challenged. We're like a teenager. Stand on a wall. Can he catch me? Oh, my dear friend, listen. Let's be honest. He's never failed you. He's never failed me. What's happened is that you and I have often set ourselves up for failure because we didn't lean on him enough. We didn't trust in him enough. Now, I told you guys that I grew up in a home where my mother, my mother could teach a master's class on worry. She was a master worrier. She worried about stuff that could never happen. I'm certain it could never happen. But she had faith in, in a sense where if it's ever going to happen, it's going to happen to me. You hear that? It's reversed. A, a level of worry that it was, was so, well, listen, my mom worried so much, nobody else in the home had to worry about anything. She did it all for us. But she also died very young and very sick, probably from worrying. But you don't want to do that. And you might be saying tonight, well, you know what? I have faith and I, I've claimed this promise and I've, I've claimed this and I've professed and I've confessed the other what does that have to do with what we're talking about? I mean this in sincerity and in charity. You and I live in a culture where true living biblical faith is how we lay hold of the promises of God and we trust him. That's what it's all about. But when we say, listen, I have faith that this is what I'm to be and this is how I'm to do it and I'm to have this lifestyle or I'm to have this thing and this and the other and we use faith almost like a pole vault to get it over some hurdle in life rather than Christ being the epicenter. It's, it's using faith to get what I want. That's not faith. That is actually one of the most ingrained delusions in so-called Christianity. Just confess it. Confess it or this. Don't confess that. Oh, I think I got a sore throat. Don't confess that. Have you ever seen people like that? They claim to have great faith, but if you say something like that, they're, they're off the hinges. They, they're all derailed. I literally know somebody who believed in that kind of doctrine all their life. They taught it, and their wife got cancer, and they would not confess that the wife had cancer. He wouldn't take her to a doctor. And they had this type of doctrine, just have faith, just have faith. You'll be healed, just have faith. She died of cancer. Now, who was wrong in that equation? Was God wrong? Of course not. They were wrong. And this is a very, very serious issue in so-called Christianity today, is that if we have faith, then everything's going to be smooth and easy. No, if we have faith, things are going to be dynamic and powerful. You can trust that to happen. Things are also going to be somewhat white knuckle. Behind my desk in my office on the credenza is a U.S. Marine Corps Kevlar helmet from Iraq, given to me by a colonel. And many times I feel like putting that on when I'm studying the Bible. Well, church, let's mark this down. We've looked at verses uh, 1 to 3 in our study last week together. Now we're in verse 4, and would you mark this down, please? It's this. The only kind of faith that works is a worship-centered faith. Worship. We're going to talk about worship. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4, it says, By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. So now we go way back to the opening chapters of Genesis, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous. Notice this, Abel, we're talking about Abel, Cain and Abel, brothers, Cain and Abel, Cain who slew Abel. Listen, was that the first murder? 
or the second murder? Ah, it's a trick question. It was technically the, the, the first murder, a human on a human. But the first, really the first murder was Satan deceiving Eve, if you think about it. She was spiritually murdered in that moment. Well, the real homicide takes place between Cain and Abel. But watch how this comes together. By faith, watch, Abel is being commended. He's a worshiper of God. And I want you to ask yourself, are you a worshiper of God? By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. Note this in your, in your uh, note-taking. Uh, it, it, we'll see this soon. Abel came with a blood sacrifice because he was a shepherd. Cain came with a grain offering because he was a farmer. Some great scholars will tell you that the reason why Cain's was rejected was because he brought from his own field wheat that he had harvested and he brought it to God instead of blood. They have a good point. When Adam and Eve sinned, what did God do? God went and got an innocent animal in the Garden of Eden and he had to have slain it himself because the Bible says that God took the skin of an animal and covered Adam and Eve with that skin. An animal had to die for Adam and Eve to have clothes from, to hide them from their nakedness. So listen, many scholars say from the beginning it was set up that you approach God with a blood sacrifice. And that is true. I get it. So they'll say, and I'm not disagreeing with them, they'll say, Abel's was accepted because it was blood. Innocent blood was shed for his offering. I'm not going to debate that. In fact, I lean more toward that. But God did also mention that you are to present a grain offering before the Lord, didn't he? We later find out in the Bible that Cain was a guy who had a temper problem. We also find out that he's got a beef with God. He's got a beef with his brother. He's just off enough to make your heart break. He's a man's man. He's a man of the field. But there's something off. Angry at God. Angry at his brother. Angry. Why was he angry? We don't know exactly. But the Bible tells us that Abel's sacrifice was accepted. Again, it could be because it was blood. If I want to push this, I'm, I'm, first of all, I'm going to go with the blood sacrifice, okay? Cain should have brought a blood sacrifice. That's my first answer to the Jeopardy question for $300. But if I want to dig deeper... Isn't our God the kind of God that regarding worship, he sees your heart? If you, listen, if you come into this building tonight, as you did, God sees your heart. You know it's coming. I can feel it coming. It's like a volcano erupting. I can hear it comes. Here it comes. Oh, pastor, we show up. We show up right before the teaching. We don't, we don't bother with worship. In fact, we know that's, we just live down the street. That's when we leave our houses when worship begins. Mm. You might want to take that to prayer before the Lord. Or, you know, when the message is over, we just get up and walk out on worship at the close. Because it's more important to get our car out of the driveway than it is to give God thanks and praise. I know this hurts, and I know these are negative church growth tactics that I'm practicing right now. <laughs> but listen, don't you sense that time is up? We're going to, we're going to heaven soon. Time's up. You can feel it. So, well, I, I'm not saying we're going to heaven like the rapture is, you know, in the next five minutes, hopefully three minutes. But anyway, I'm saying, I'm, what I'm saying is this, is that uh, this world is off its hinges. And I, I don't worry about it. I know that we're going we're gonna to see him soon. Now, I, don't, I have no inside information. I could die of old age, but that won't be long. And some 16-year-old in here and I go, yeah, man, you just go, old man, because I got a whole life to live. Listen, 16 years old now? Dude, blink five times, you need to be 35. <laughs> I had somebody tell me this weekend, this last weekend up in Northern California, they said, man, when I was in high school, 
time just wouldn't go by. It just took forever. And now I'm in college and I blink and it's like it's almost over. And I said, man, you know what? Right now for you, enjoy it right now. This is the slowest time will ever be for you. Because when you're 66 years old, man, I, I go to bed, I wake up, and it's in another month. How many can say amen to that? Look at this. Young people. <laughs> Make the best of every moment. And every moment should be a time of worship. How we move, how we live, how we breathe, worship. Our life is to be a Christ-centered, worshipful life. And it's amazing because as you do that, you won't miss out on any plan that God has for your life. Oh, what about a man? What about a woman? Worship God first. And then God will give you the man or the woman that he wants you to have. God first. Seek first. Matthew 6, 33. Seek first the kingdom of God and all these other things will be added to you. Don't add these, all these other things to you and then decide to seek God. Oh, you'll seek God all right. Why did I do this? Best to wait and be led by God. But listen, friends, you will not experience his leading unless you are a worshiper. Abel was a worshiper. And Cain missed it. Turn in your Bibles, if you would, to Genesis 4. You can turn there, you can cheat and look at the screen. It's always good to turn the pages, though. Genesis 4, watch this, verse 1. Now Adam knew Eve, his wife. You know what that means, right? And she conceived and bore Cain and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. And then she bore again, this time his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Now I'm okay with this personally. I'm just saying, it's my opinion. Shouldn't we give everything as first fruits to God? Our, the first of our income is to go to God. The first of our hours in the morning to go to God. The first of our leisure should go to God. Him first. So I don't have a problem with this. It's probably true that he should have brought blood. But let's just go past that and look at the heart of this man. Because I want to ask in verse 3, how did he bring it? Was he grumbling all the way there? Oh, man. What is it's Tomorrow's Sunday? Oh. Don't tell me we're going again. We are. Oh, man. To church again we go. What kind of attitude was in his heart as he brought an offering Verse 4, Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock. See the first one? And of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. That terrifies me. That's a searching verse. Can you imagine walking in and God, think about it. You know how you go through a you know, security checkpoint things? That sounds kind of... Berlin, 1930, isn't it? You know, checkpoint. What am I talking about? TSA. You know, airplanes. What's the thing? Security check, I guess, right? Gosh, it just, I didn't realize how kind of Nazi that sounded until I said it. And I, Are you going through security check? You guys, I'm old enough to remember we used to get out of the car and walk onto the plane. That's how old I am. Do you remember that? Those were the days. <laughs> So you go through, and uh, facial. Yesterday, did that, and all they wanted was my face. Just, can you, excuse me, sir, stand still. Look at the dot. Okay, you're free to go. Somebody somewhere, somehow, some system, that's his face. Walking into church, walking out of church, God knows he sees that's your face. He knows. He not only has facial recognition, he's got heart recognition. <laughs> Attitude. Remarkable. Wow. It's very convicting to ask yourself this question. When was the last time I worshipped the Lord with an offering that it pleased him? 
Because I can tell you a little worship secret, friends. When you worship him rightly, you will be affected. You will be affected immediately. Immediately. Listen, a little side note. Those of you who, for whatever reason, you get, maybe it's a, a, a scary night. You heard something. You've heard, you whatever, demonic activity. There's somebody in your life that's w- got a Ouija board tied around their neck or something. I don't know what. And it's like things have been weird since I've come into this place and that, this house. I don't know. You want to you wanna, wanna hear some power? There's a reason why when the children of Israel crossed over on, across the Jordan River into battle, they put the Ark of the Covenant out front and the worshipers. Can you imagine? Here's all the Israeli commandos. And Joshua says, okay, all the, all the skilled military men? Yeah, hoorah! In the back. What? Are you horn-blowing priests with the manicured fingers and the little soft feet? In the front. And they're like, what? Wait, we're the scholars. <laughs> what? You guys, up front, we're going to war. We're crossing over. We're going to take the land. What do we do? Blow the horns. Isn't that wild? Worship has incredible destructive powers in the kingdom of hell. Worship has incredible powers against the kingdom of hell. Listen, if stuff's going on in your life, worship. Remember when David's son died? The first thing he did was worship. Worship is not, I'm going to put on some Christian music. Look, I love love some Christian music. But that's not what I'm talking about. Put on worship. Hide a song in your heart that is biblically accurate and sing it in the night. Make it a prayer. Incredible power. Back, Back to the reading, Genesis And um, verse 5, but he did not respect Cain and his offering, and Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. So this implies, by the way, go look it up on your own. This implies that he knew what he was supposed to do, and he didn't do it. This This is a textbook tantrum. The tragic thing is he's a mature man, fallen as he is. Can you imagine the world that they grew up in, fallen, fallen, you say, well, I don't know, maybe, how could it be any worse than this? I'm just saying that mom and dad came from perfection. They crossed the line and they had these two boys. Can you imagine? Whatever snapped in Cain's life, I mean, this should cheer some of us up. Mom and dad were the perfect human beings. Granted, they fell. They have now fallen into sin. They have children and Somebody could psychoanalyze this passage to conclude there's a parenting problem here. Maybe. I don't know. I don't think so. Because the Bible tells us that Cain appears to be very responsible for his own actions. And that seems like foreign language in our day, doesn't it? His countenance fell. He he knew what to bring, which could answer the blood issue, right? Right? But don't you think maybe it's his heart? So the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? What a great uh, translation. Why is your mug in the dust? (laughs) Watch what God says to him. If you do well, will you not be accepted? Oh my This is the report card. And if you do not well, sin lies at the door. That's an incredible statement. Sin, listen, it means this. You guys can all hear me? You know what this verse means? It means that sin, first of all, how many of you believers raise your hands? Okay, hands down. I was going to ask you then how many of you are non-believers, but it doesn't matter. The answer is the same. Sin, believer or non-believer, sin is still at your door at your heels, at your doorstep. Uh, Always there, like a cat prowling, waiting to pounce. Can Can you imagine if tonight you got word that there was some sort of maniac serial killer loose in your neighborhood and you get home and there's helicopters flying over, there's police everywhere? And they're saying, stay in your car, don't get out. And you say, oh, what do they know? 
and you pull up in your driveway. Garage door opens up. You pull in, shut the garage door. Whew, safe. And that weasel snuck right in there when your garage door was going open. And then you shut the door, and it's just you and him. That's pretty gross, right? Think of sin being like that. It's waiting to get you, waiting to pounce. And listen, what you don't want to do in your Christian experience is hand Satan, hand sin the opportunity to get you. Have you ever seen these people? like They're like uh, Christian snake dancers. Have you seen those guys? I got faith. I have faith. I can hold a poisonous snake, and it's not going to get me. And it, oh, and it gets, and it gets them. These are like the faith snake handling Christian tour. What are you crazy? You don't do that. Sin is waiting to bite, lurking, waiting. At your door, and its desire is for you. But you should rule over. That you should rule over it. What a what a promise that is. Well, I don't know why I just keep sinning. Because you love it. Pastor, please pray for me. I don't know what's going on. I just can't seem to shake this sin in my life. Well, let's start here. You love it. If you loved him more than it, you'd get victory over it. I'm telling you right now. Guys, I'm only talking to you guys. I'm not talking to any girls. I'm talking to the guys. I'm telling you straight up. I just have a problem in this area. You have a problem in that area because that's where Jesus is not Lord. It's a fact. I know what I'm talking about. You can, have all, you can have an app on your phone that protects you from all the things that you're prone to do and all that kind of stuff. You can have bells and whistles. There can be a hammer flies out of your phone and slaps you in the face. You can have all that stuff. The alarms can go off. Your wife, grandma, aunt comes slapping you in the face. Go ahead. Go ahead. Do it. It's pathetic, but do it because you want to know why right now. You can have all that stuff. It doesn't change your heart. But when you fall in love with him, and you worship him in spirit and in truth, there ain't no room in there for the stuff of this world. And God will supernaturally take the little sparkling, tinkly things of this life that's like a snake waiting to pounce on you, and he'll make them sick to your stomach. And there's no room for it. And he said, wait a minute. I know what that makes me feel like. I know where that sends me. I'm not going there anymore because I have spent time with Jesus, and he's intoxicating and I'm not going to sacrifice that wonderful worship for that old habitual knock at the door. Nope, not going to do it. And friends, listen, we need to, we need to do, uh, I, I want to encourage you to do two things. Yes, we can say to the evil that comes tempting I rebuke this in Jesus' name. I do that, but I also do something that's super doubly extra. Because <laughs> look, we look, we look different on the outside, sort of. We're the same on the inside. So some, some lady right here, I don't, know what, I don't know what you're talking about. Well, f- for you, it might be a sale at Nordstrom's. You just, you just pull out your credit cards and start driving toward the mall. And you, can't, you have no, no self-control. Whatever it is. You can say, I rebuke that temptation in Jesus' name, but then I quickly follow up with the surefire shot. And that is, Lord, I ask you to rebuke that, to protect me against that, Lord. I'll exercise, you'll exercise the authority God's given you, biblically based, but at the same time, didn't Michael the archangel Ask the Lord to rebuke Satan when he was battling with Satan over the body of Moses. That's a message for some other time, and boy, is it wild. This is incredible. And so, verse 8, Now Cain talked with Abel, his brother. This is creepy. And it came to pass when they were in the field. 
that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. Wow. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel, your brother? He said, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? This guy's talking back to God like you can't believe. Did anybody know the answer to that question, by the way? Do you guys know what the answer is? According to the Bible, the answer is, yes, we are our brother's keeper. Did you know that? What am I? Am I my brother's keeper? Excuse me, hello? He's called your brother. You're in a family. You're to keep him. It means you're to love him, watch out for him, look out for his best, take care of one another, have each other's back. If that's true in the world, how much more true is it regarding the Christian brother and sister in Christ Jesus? If it's true in military, if it's true in law enforcement, how much more for you and I who wore a war of invisible weaponry and we need each other? None of us will make it being isolated. Not a one. You may think so. You're not going to make it alone. We got to fight together. We got to stick together. And we need to shut down, by the way, things that try to divide the brethren. There are some division, and we're going through that in this world right now, where the church is being divided, and so it should. I mean that sincerely. When a church is all woked out and all gendered out and all LBGTQ'd out and BLM out and, and uh, BMW out and <laughs> whatever, and that church departs in apostasy from truth, let it go. Let it go. It's tragic, but it's part of the end time event. God is purifying his church. He's shaking the church right now on the earth. He's separating the wheat from the chaff. He's separating the Cain from the Abel. And in this point, the defining factor is going to be the worshiper. For us to worship him in such a way where you lay hold of him. Can you imagine, as we mentioned last time, remember last time we talked about Moses, and Moses says, I'm not going to go unless you go with me, and oh, by the way, just show me your glory. Remember, we talked about that last time. Moses was a worshiper. Man, I'd like to see the stuff Moses saw. Then start worshiping. Closing your eyes. Listen, you gotta, sometimes you've got to close your eyes, right? And memorize the song. Look, I... I don't know. I think eventually, didn't Pastor Chuck eventually cave in to having words on the screens? But I remember at Calvary Costa Mesa, uh, early on, Pastor Chuck did not want hymns on the screens because he wanted the people to open the hymnals and memorize and learn the hymns. You know what we do now? We, we We read the songs and then you forget Hide the truth of God in your heart. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, what have you done? God says, what have you done? Of course God knew. The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. You think God's exaggerating here? I don't. God's a chemist. He's a biologist. He's a phlebotomist. (laughs) He's an engineer designer. In God's world of his creation, your brother's blood is calling to me. I don't think God's playing games. Can you imagine of all the murder that goes on in the world, can you imagine a child that is inside the mother, we've all seen it, if you haven't, go watch it, a a baby inside the womb trying to get away from the device that's trying to tear him apart? Have you seen that happen? He's pushing it away, trying to get away from this suction. And God says, "I, I hear the blood. The baby's blood's crying to me. I hear that. A murderous event. God says, I hear that. Uh, An accident, an injury, war. God says, I hear that. Wow. It's remarkable to me that God is the God of all worship, that when the Bible tells us that he, in worship, involves the entire creation itself, the Bible tells us that when 
the physical universe was created, it says that the sons of God, the angels, sang in praise when they saw creation happen. They freaked. Come on, you got to think that through because I don't think angels... The Bible says the angels freaked out. They sang. They, I, he, he, he did it. He spoke it. And they went nuts with praise. The angels went nuts. I don't think... Listen, I don't think they would have done that over evolution. It's just like, oh, can you wake me when this is over? <laughs> the Bible says they burst in out, out into worship at creation. Wow. Number two is this in verse five. We're going, we're really going fast now. Verse five, the only kind of faith that works is an intimately active faith. Intimately active. I'm going to do my best to keep this um, just in, in, a, in a group setting like this. Um, it didn't sound right, I know. But intimately active, and this is almost a double active, faith. So the right kind of faith works this way. It's intimately active faith. So what do you mean by that? Well, he's going to tell us. I love this guy. His name is Enoch. By faith. Notice twice now. By faith Abel. Now, by faith Enoch was taken away. So that he did not see death. And was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. <laughs> this is awesome. Okay, first of all, those of you who struggle with the doctrine of the rapture, this is kind of fun. Enoch got raptured. So I don't know, I don't know. I don't see the word rapture there. <laughs> get, a, get a Latin Bible and you'll find it. He was taken away. Nobody can say it like Dr. J. Vernon McGee. The Bible says that Enoch walked with God. So, okay, back up. First of all, worship, Abel, what was it? That Abel offered a sacrifice to God that was acceptable. So he worshiped. Enoch walked with God. And so I think he intimately, actively walked with God. Now, we don't know how this happened. How did they walk? What was that like? Did Remember, this is a post-fallen world. Was, was Enoch, did he see something? Or did he sense God? Did he, did he see some movement in the atmosphere? Or was there nothing at all except the assured presence of God? And he took a walk with God. I don't know. I have to honestly tell you, I don't care for this reason. Do you, listen, do you as a believer recognize the presence of God Whenever you want. I know that's not a very theologically astute thing to say, but isn't it accurate? Whenever you want to go meet with God alone, intimately active with God, do you not realize that he's there? There's a sense, isn't it, in the believer's life. It's you know he's there. You know he's listening. And you talk or you sing to him or you pray or you sit silent and you're so mindful of him. So more mindful. How do I put this? More mindful than what? More mindful than anything else in the entire universe. And when it really gets great, you're not even mindful of you anymore, of me anymore. And, you, and there's a moment, please, please, if, I'm assuming you know this. There's a moment when you're, you're alone, you're, you're intimately active, faith is in action, there's nobody around, and you're just saying, Lord... You are awesome. You cast, you throw lightning bolts, Job says. God, you are the one who hung the earth in space upon nothing, your Bible says. Your word says that where in the deep, distant wilderness, you're there when the deer is giving birth to its young and nobody sees. God, you're awesome. 
you know what? When you just start thinking about his attributes like that and talking out loud, go find a place. Get to a place. Make it a place. Well, I'm a, I'm a, you know, I want to, I'm a man and I don't want to be seen like that. Well, you need to grow out of that really quick. You need to get along with him. I think, I, think, I think it takes more of a man to get along with God and be with God than a guy who pretends to be a guy. Yes. And listen, since I just beat up the guys, ladies, you got to, <laughs> sometimes you need to be silent with God. <laughs> God bless you. Have a great night. <laughs> no, but J. Vernon McGee put it this way. That Enoch walked with God, however that was, we do not know. But it's so sweet because he walked with God and he pleased God, which means that Enoch had faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. And so Enoch is pleasing to the Lord. He walks with God. By the way, are we not in the New Testament era known by our walk with God? Are we not to walk with God? Doesn't the Bible say walk in the light as he's in the light? How is your walk? Paul says the walk. Peter says the walk. We're supposed to check on each other to see how the walk is doing. How you doing? Oh, I, got, I need to walk closer. You know what? I, I just dawned on me. I, I, I didn't remember this until right before I came out. I, I told a couple of guys in the back. I said, we were at my grandson's baseball games. And they were two, they're two different ages. They're on two different fields. So we look like lunatics. We're playing at the exact same time. We're running this way. Yeah, you go. You do it. You go. <laughs> Run over there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm back and forth. And so at one point, I'm standing between both fields. <laughs> compromising. <laughs> and this lady, I don't know. I'm, I don't know. She was elderly. I mean, I am too, but she was beyond <laughs> me. <laughs> and... She said, Pastor Jack, I pray for you all the time. And I want you to know, you can get weary. You can be tempted to be tired and just be exhausted. But keep him your first love. Always keep him your first love. And I said, thank you. That is awesome. God bless you. Thank you for praying for us. And that, that is so, so great. And she walks away for a moment, for, and I'm thinking, I, wow, I, you know what? And I'm, it's like, she's gone. Where'd she go? And I'm not, I don't want to read too much into this, but it's like, that's exactly what I needed at that very moment. But you know what? Stuff like that happens when you walk with him. Well, what else is going to happen? That's the joy of you being intimately relational with him by yourself. I'm trying to set this up to get you to think. For those of you who are husbands and wives, listen, kids, it's time to go to bed. But it's three o'clock in the afternoon. Time to go to bed. (laughs) What's, What's going on here? Well, your mother and I are going to be intimately active in our faith. <laughs> so what does that mean? You go, you go that way, we're going to discuss what, what we're going to get you for Christmas. If you interrupt us, you know, whatever. So what are you talking about? You're going to go be alone. You don't invite the world in, you shut the world out. Unless you're a pervert, then you put a camera in your room and stream it to the world because you're a reprobate. It's private, it's personal, it's designed by God. Your time, listen, I cannot do your time. Aren't you the pastor? I am the pastor. But aren't you the Christian? We're both sheep of his pasture. I can't be alone for you. Well, what if we give you a raise? I can't be alone for you. It's not for me to be alone for you. You've got to be alone with him yourself. There can be no surrogate in worship. There can be no surrogate in faith. 
It's real and it has to be you. And it will transform you. Some of you know exactly what I'm about to say. When you have been alone with him, you come out of that time and there's a smile on your face. And you're relaxed and you're calm. And it's like, hey, the world just blew up. (laughs) Heaven's my home. God is awesome. Let's see how we can help. People are rattled and coming apart of the seams because they're not being alone with them. How's the world treating you? Horrible! Get alone with God. I can't believe this is going on. Oh, why not? It's the end times. Have you seen anybody running around with red underwear and an Antichrist t-shirt on? I got to tell you, it's, it's not easy to be intimately active in your faith. It's not easy. You got to first of all, we're, we're, we'll have to end with this. You're going to have to first of all make a date with God. And, and tragically in our world, you do have to make a date. It's, it's not good. When I say make a date with God in our active Southern California lives, so We used to be Southern California, the laid-back lifestyle. Where did that go? So now you have to make an appointment with God. I think that's okay. It's better than not having an appointment with God. So if I were to say to you, no matter what your age, that whatever time you get up in the morning, go home tonight, set your alarm for an hour earlier than that. Are you okay? An hour? You mean, What? Look, you, you do it once a year when you lose time when you change the clock anyway. Watch what happens. Lose an hour of sleep. Spend it with God. Watch how much energy you have during the day. Watch what happens. The, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. The scriptures tell us we will mount up as though we had the wings of an eagle. We will walk. We will not Grow weary, we'll run, and we won't faint. We'll be, how does that happen? I don't know, I don't know. But I would love for you, and look, you're the Wednesday nighters. You're special. (laughs) I'd love to see you guys so determined. That's it. I'm gonna set my clock an hour early. I'm gonna be with God. I want to encourage you. In fact, let's stand. I want to encourage you. Listen. We're going to worship in a moment, so I don't think it would be a good time for you to leave. (laughs) Um, You're like, all right, let's do it. And you're telling your friend, yeah, you're going to to set your, I'm going to set my alarm. You set your alarm? Let's set our alarms. Watch what happens. Listen, if you doubt that there's a real Satan, you're going you're gonna to find out tonight. You set your alarm tonight before you go to bed, and you're going to lay there and you're going to look at your clock. <laughs> Is it time yet? And you're, Is it time yet? You're gonna, you'll, you'll have some form of interruption. Stick to it. Watch what happens. Go out to wherever, if it's the backyard, if it's the, if, I don't care where it is, bathroom, patio, I don't, it doesn't matter. Find your place and meet them. Mm-hmm.